Hi, Emil Guillermo with the PETA Podcast. Don't miss PETA's 40th anniversary and holiday party coming up Saturday, December 12th, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. Streamed live, you can celebrate with stars and special guests. Saturday, December 12th, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern for PETA's 40th anniversary and holiday party. Buy your tickets now at PETA.org. This month, we continue to celebrate the wide release of the new documentary executive produced by Angelica Houston. Breaking the Chain is now available without charge on Amazon Prime. It features real PETA workers freeing dogs who are imprisoned in their own backyards. Here's more on Breaking the Chain, now available free on Amazon Prime, on this edition of The PETA Podcast. Ten years on a chain is like a prison. And then one day, Edith the dog was missing, and Jess Cochran thought she was dead. How Jess found and saved Edith, a true story from the new documentary Breaking the Chain, next on The PETA Podcast. Welcome to The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this behind-the-scenes look at PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. On today's episode, PETA saves dogs one at a time, and Edith is a case in point. Edith is a dog who lived on a chain in a rural part of the country near the PETA offices for 10 years. For those 10 years, Edith's owners would welcome PETA's Community Animal Project to give her care. And then she was gone. And PETA field worker Jess Cochran, who cared for Edith, thought the dog was lost forever. Their story is just one story in Breaking the Chain, the new documentary executive produced by Oscar winner Angelica Houston. The film follows field workers like Cochran as they go around the Norfolk, Virginia area trying to save dogs from being chained and tethered all their lives. Here's Jess Cochran to talk about the life-saving efforts of PETA to save chained dogs like Edith on the PETA podcast. First of all, how does it feel to be part of a documentary that captures exactly what the Community Animal Project does? We're all very excited about the documentary, and I feel very proud to be a part of it. You know, this is a um, a topic that I don't think a lot of people know about, and it really, you know, brings light to that topic that's, you know, kind of been in the background for so long. Well, it is sort of basic when you talk about animals and people and who comes in to help. It's, it's people like the Communi- Community Animal Project who swoop in and try to make right things that are wrong and it must be kind of gratifying to see yourself i mean i don't imagine you see yourself in action you're just doing your thing but when you see yourself actually doing the things that are really pretty incredible helping people who can't help themselves with their animals helping animals that must make you feel it's like an out-of-body experience to see yourself doing something so good for the community and for for people you know, it was definitely very interesting to um, see myself work. You're right. That's I don't see that side. Um, and, you know, I, I think generally I'm kind of a shy person. Um, and I think it made me realize a lot of things about myself and, you know, the work that we do that I maybe did not notice before. Well, what, like what? What did you think that? You know, like, oh, God, this is really cool. Or, God, you know, I I was really kind to that. Or I was, I should have been more forceful. What what did you come away with when you were watching yourself at work in action? You know, we have a lot of the same conversations over and over again. So it's, it's you know, bring your dog inside. This is why. And it's like, you know, I think that all of us genuinely feel those conversations every time we have them. You know, sometimes I think, am I kind of just going through the motions here as I've had this conversation a hundred thousand times before? And it's like, I really do feel it every time I have that conversation and try to connect with the people that I'm talking to so that, you know, they both want 
you know, they want to hear what I have to say. Well, it is important because a lot of these people aren't even thinking about the animals that they are supposed to be caring for. And when you come in, sort of like the voice of reason to come in and make bad things better, uh, you're telling people to, you know, that dog wants to be indoors. That dog shouldn't be outside. That dog, you know, that there's no indoor dog and outdoor dog. They're all indoor dogs. Uh, when you when you when you start hearing you say that, I I guess it does seem like oh you say it a hundred thousand times, but each time you say it, it's because there's an animal in distress and you're caring for it. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I think you can see in the documentary. It's the first time some people have heard these things. I mean, the conversation I had with the guy about all dogs are house dogs, you can tell he had never heard that before. Yeah, all poodles are house dogs, yeah. which is not the case in our experience either. Yeah. But, you know, it just it had never crossed his mind that a pit bull could be a house dog. And now that's something for him to really think about and digest. And, you know, maybe it did not change his mind, but it's it's information to build on. And, you know, that's it, it's hope that things will get better and he'll understand his animals a little bit better. But it also shows that when you go down there as the CAP representative, the Community Animal Project representative, you don't go in there as this, uh, you're not like, law enforcement or you know ice or something like that trying to like bust anybody you really are going in there with the uh, with with caring and dare i say with love and you know trying to educate and inform people uh i guess you must have seen that when you're watching it absolutely we're not law enforcement and if you come into a situation telling people what they should be doing in an aggressive or forceful way really does not work. Um, and, you know, we're, we just wouldn't be able to do the things that we do. You know, we offer a lot of services and, um, you know, I think that's what opens up our conversation with people either, you know, if they call us for a doghouse or spay, and then that gives us the opportunity to really have more in-depth conversations about like, hey, you invited me onto your property and now I would like to share with you my thoughts on the whole situation. And we'll talk about spay neuter and the doghouse as well. And so people, they begin this relationship, but it's, they first call PETA for the, is it, is it free spay neutering or free or reduced services, veterinary services? What, what, what is it that they call the initial reason for the contact? Yeah, it's for free services. And I mean, it's, you know, our work in North Carolina, it's, you know, there aren't a lot of resources down there. And, you know, people's financial situation is not stable. So it's not things that they could generally afford. Um, you know, spay neuter at a private clinic is, you know, over 100 or $200. That's, you know, that's a lot um, when you're really kind of just getting by. So, you know, they call for our free services for their animals. And sometimes it's, hey, you know, I ran out of money for the week. Can you bring me a bag of dog food? And that's something we'll definitely do. You know, I don't think people really understand that a lot of this is not for, you know, this big ogre corporation PETA going in and trying to, uh, you know, right the world. But it really is, you know, a, a service where you go in for the animals to help the animals, but you, in order to help the animals, first you have to build this relationship with the, the animal companions who don't realize how, how significant their role is to, to help the animals. And so you do develop relationships, right? Absolutely. And, you know, I, um, you know, when we have new staff, I, Usually I'm a part of training them. And, you know, I tell people, you know, 70% of our job is talking to people. The other part, hanging out with the animals, by far my favorite part of it. But, you know, it, it it's about education and talking to people because, you know, we can't just come in and take people's animals. So, yes, in some situations we, you know, 
educate them and get to the point of where they do surrender them because they understand it's not the best situation for the animal, but we can't just go in there and take the animal. We have to have conversations about it and tell them, you know, maybe why it's not the best situation for the animal. So it, it it's a lot of having connections with people. And, and th- those connections develop into relationships because if you watch, if people watch the documentary breaking the chain, the community animal project folks are, are going in there sometimes on a regular basis and they see the same people and the same dogs and it almost becomes like PETA becomes the de facto dog or animal companion because you're there on behalf of the of the real owners who don't have the wherewithal, don't really know what to do. And so you get to know, how many, how many times would you say in a lifetime do you see the same dog? I mean, pretty routinely, I guess, huh? Oh, yeah, absolutely. We have we have thousands of cases, but there's, we schedule after each stop, we schedule a follow-up uh, time frame. So if it's maybe in more urgent situation, we go back in a week or, you know, maybe if uh, it it's less urgent. We'd go back in six weeks or so. So these, these animals, these dogs and cats that we meet, we meet them, you know, we, we go see them often exactly like what happened with Edith and myself. I visited her all the time. Yeah. Edith is a big uh, part of uh, breaking the chain of the documentary that captures uh, the work of the community animal project and, of you, uh, you, you, Jess, you're you're right there out in the field. So tell us about Edith. How how did you find her? Was she? How did she come into your life? So Edith's guardians had called into our office. Um, it was around 2006, and were requesting dog houses. She was um, chained out several other dogs on the property, so they had called and requested dog houses for them. I was the field worker that went out um, and we did our first basic intro getting the guardians information as well as all of the dogs on the property. Um, We got them set up with the dog house. Uh, The other dogs on the property were pit bulls um, that they were breeding. So, you know, it was always really hard because there were a lot of issues going on there. So of course, you know, Edith was focused on, but, you know, it's like we would go there and there would be an emaciated dog. So there was a lot going on on the property where she lived. Um, So we visited often. And also, if I was just in the area, I would stop by to see her as well. She was always so excited to see us. Um, You know, she has this very endearing flop for a belly rub that she does, and she does it instantly when she sees you. It's just so sweet. I could never drive past her and not stop. Yeah. Oh, and this is just because of repeated visits. You get to know the dog. And why weren't they taking better care of her? Yeah. Um, you know, there, like I said, there was a lot going on there. And it was also hard to catch her guardian at home to actually have in-depth conversations with her because – you know, there were a lot of people living at the residence. And, you know, if we stopped by, it would usually be the grandson. And, you know, some, so we did not get really get to connect with Edith's guardian. Mm -hmm. We did sometimes. And I think that, you know, she really didn't see anything wrong with the way that uh, Edith was living because that's all she's ever known of how dogs live. Um, So, It definitely, you know, it definitely took a long time. And, you know, I think one of the most common questions that I get about, you know, Edith was chained outside for 10 years. 10 years. 10 10 years. years. Yeah. and And I visited her for nine of those years. So I think a lot of comments are always like, well, I would have just stolen her. Yeah. I would have loved to just walk in there and take Edith and have had her you know, my, her whole life, but that's just it, you know, 
the things that we do affects all of the animals that we help. And that if they do not surrender them to us, we that would jeopardize every other animal that we help out there. Our relationships are built on trust. And if people in the community don't trust us, you know, there's a huge problem. Yeah. And it's also against the law. You couldn't just go in there <laughs> yes. and, and, and steal an animal. And yet I, I know there are people who think that PETA does that, that PETA, you know, and then that they don't, not only do they take dogs, they, they kill dogs. They, and you, you hear that and that must pain you when you know that, you know, it, it couldn't be further from the truth that, that in fact, you're developing these, these relationships. And as I said, you're kind of like the de facto owner or, uh, you know, animal companion guardian of these dogs that you help to, to, you know, bring back uh, to a normal life, you know, off the chain and into the home. Yeah, absolutely. You know, people say some really terrible things about PETA, don't they? Mm. And you know, a lot of it revolves around our euthanasia numbers. And the thing is, is that when they say these terrible things about PETA and the euthanasia, it's it's these individuals, our field workers in the documentary that they're talking about. And these are people who care so much about the animals that we help. And there's, there's um, you know, it, it, it breaks our heart and we give so much of ourselves that it, you know, there's, these are a group of the most caring people I have ever met. Yeah. So it is hard when people say a lot of negative stuff about us. But, but it's, it's, it's simply not true because if an animal is uh, euthanized, it's generally because something is, you know, the animal has been, dis- is diseased or is sick. Um, and it, there's no hope for, for the animal that's better than, uh, the euthanasia option, uh, it really is, it, it is a, a matter of compassion. And I don't think uh, people realize that uh, the the condition of a lot of dogs and, you know, that you find when you're out in the field. I mean, the film depicts dogs who are decomposed dogs. I mean, I mean, that, that must happen a lot, huh? Right. You know, I, I do think it's that people do not understand the, animals that we are working with there are situations that break down dogs both behaviorally and medically and you know it's hard to come back from that these are not puppies that people have raised in their house and now they're moving and they bring to a shelter themselves these are dogs that you know their guardians if they were sick or sick or injured or they're moving it doesn't it doesn't really, they don't have the knowledge to think like, okay, I'm going to take this dog to a shelter. It's like, I'll see if somebody wants him. If not, you know, he'll, you know, he'll be all right on his own or something like that. So it's like, you know, these are not the same animals that are brought into the shelters by their guardians. They have gone through a lot. They've been chained. They've not been properly socialized. They have not been properly vetted. They're, the odds are stacked against them. Yeah. And so the op, the best option usually is for them to be put down. But I think people don't realize that if you warehouse them in a, a no kill shelter, how is that better than what they would have been in chained up in someone's yard? Really. Right. Or it, it's all about quality of life, right? It's, mm-hmm. you know, our basic needs need to be met in neither of those situations. Basic needs are not met. We have to have, you know, we have to have stimulation. We have to have love. And if you're talking about 200 dogs in a facility, there is no way that those dogs needs are met. Yeah. So when the cat program goes out there, I mean, you meet dogs, you try to help them, you try to help not just the dogs, but also the guardians try to give them education, you give them free services, you end up essentially being, as I said, like the de facto guardians of the, of the dog. And then let's get back to Edith again. What, what happened with, with Edith so that at some point the, the guardian said, you know, they saw that you have a relationship with Edith 
that they actually give Edith up to up for you know, they put Edith up for adoption. So we lost Edith for a couple of years. Like I said, there were several people that lived on the property. So the aunt moved out and, you know, the, we didn't know where she went. And, um, you know, I definitely thought because of her age and, you know, general lack of ne- lack of care that she had died and no one really gave us any information otherwise Uh, So when we found her again on the straw delivery, uh, you know, I went right out there and basically, I mean, her guardian, I talked to him about her being older and arthritis and, you know, how she really deserves to be inside now. And I did, I was like, I've been visiting her for, you know, a decade now. And I mean, I told her I had every intention of an adopting her myself, that I loved her and I wanted her to be with me for the rest of her life. And uh, she agreed, thankfully. Wow. And how, so how old was Edith then again? And how old is she now? Uh, so Edith was 10 then and she's 14 now. Oh, wow. and how is her quality of life? I guess with you, she, it must be pretty high, huh? Yeah. Uh, Edith is, man, she is so fun to hang out with. She's a super happy, easygoing dog. You know, we nicknamed her Bunny because when she goes to the dog park or, you know, running around outside, she just kind of hops around like a little bunny and she's, she's full of life. You know, she definitely has arthritis and she can't do some things, but she really does not let it hold her back. Yeah. And I guess the adjustment from being chained up, I mean, to the day that she was, uh, to the day you adopted her, was she still chained? Yes. Um, I mean, they didn't never brought her in indoors even for the, a slight majority. No, no majority. No, uh, I actually, I had talked to her guardian about that, about, you know, at least bringing her inside when I thought maybe she wouldn't, surrender her and she said oh no she she doesn't like it inside which is just as far from the truth as possible you know Edith hates it during the summer outside she'll go outside for a very short walk or in the backyard and then she's right back inside she definitely prefers the temperature to be regulated for her Um, so I mean she, she she definitely is a unique situation because it is not typical for a dog to be chained for 10 years, leave all that behind them, and then just adjust perfectly into an inside setting. A, you know, I have other animals. She is just a pleasure for everyone to be around. She likes everybody she meets. And, you know, that's that's not a typical situation for a dog that's been isolated and neglected now what what is her her background she's a mix right she's a yeah she's a chow mix yeah and so that's a lot of hair during the summertime i mean so <laughs> yes, she it is and she's outside all the time 24 7 yeah i mean every time we went you know she had mats on her when we did get her surrendered you know she had to her tail had to be completely shaved off because it was just one big mat uh so she definitely has a high level of grooming needs yeah and so the transition taking her from the chain to your home was it harder or easier than you thought it was easier than I thought it was going to be because I knew that she had a very, she had a lot of trauma in her past. You you know, it's, it's not easy to overcome. And like I said, it's not a typical situation for her to just come in and be totally fine. You know, not all chows are okay with being around cats. I have cat, I had cats at the time. I have cats now. And so these were all things that, you know, I was definitely thinking about, um, that could have made it where she wouldn't have been a good fit for my house. Um, but luckily, you know, she came in, she was wonderful with the cats. She's such 
an understanding, gentle soul. It's really unbelievable. She she likes everybody she meets. People, well, cats, dogs, everyone. Well, this is one of the happy stories in Breaking the Chain, the new documentary that's uh, executive produced by Angelica Houston. It really covers the the work of the Community Animal Project. And you know we've been talking about how Jess Cochran, who's a field worker, goes out there, discovers this dog, and for essentially nine years, ten years, really, has this relationship as a field worker and then ends up adopting her. This is one of the, the gratifying stories of, of the documentary, but not all of them are this happy. I mean, uh, and to see these dogs on chains, and some of them have chains embedded on their on their on their on their throats. I mean, to, I mean, I I can't imagine a dog just you know living chained up, and the, the chain becomes part of its body in the in the way that it's depicted. But that's common, right? That's it is common, say. and you know, unfortunately, there are a lot of sad stories out there. Um, it's very common now and i'm hoping that this documentary will really bring light to the topic and it w- the regularity in those sad cases will really decrease yeah and it's you know there's the the people who do things like they they chain them up and so the chain becomes part of the body but then there are the people who say well dog can, the dog can handle another 10 hours you know if they're going to the vet or something you know the uh, the 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 situation of the sick dog who was in the rain i mean that's now how common is that don't tell me that's very common um unfortunately it it really is uh pretty common i mean you know we have an after hours emergency phone for a reason and um you know i'm not saying it's every day but it it is a fairly common situation for someone to need resources and you know either like with the dog in the pen the you know local uh law enforcement i think that they had tried calling animal control you know they operate during business hours and you know that's really why we have this service available to people and you know also a lot of our calls on our after hours line uh, it's um you know very loving guardians who have their animals and unfortunately overnight you know things can change really quickly um you know and need euthanasia services at times when uh vet clinics are not open and you know euthanasia at a regular vet is something very expensive that not everybody can afford and then you're talking about at an emergency vet you're going to double or triple that it's it's just unfortunately you know we provide services that a lot of people don't yeah. have access to in any other way. Now, I know that we talked about the trolls, the PETA trolls who just attack PETA um, incessantly. And I'd, I'd like for them all, to, and, and anyone who is uh, under the, uh, you know, under the spell of these trolls to, to see breaking the chain and see what PETA does for the for the animals because if they see this film they'll see the truth and they'll see exactly how 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 much field workers like you Jess really care i mean the conversations you have with people are, are so genuine but like you said I mean, you you must have had these conversations hundreds of times and it, you know but you still seem to to care each time Right. It's, uh, you know, it's a life of living on hope. And, you know, I hope that the PETA trolls watch the documentary and their minds are changed about what we do. I'm not convinced all of them will, even though it is a very powerful movie. And I live on hope that, you know, these animals that we serve, that their lives are going to get better and maybe not their lives, but the next generation of lives. Now, what would you like people to take away from you know, after they see this? What should they be focusing on? Like, is, especially if they're skeptical, what should they look for? What should they, you know, if they they want to 
you know, they have the experience of seeing breaking the chain. What, what would you say to people? You know, I think the most important thing to take away from the documentary is that everybody is capable of helping these animals. They are out there. You may not, you know, your eyes may have been closed to them before, but they're open now. You've seen it. It's out there, you know, and that we all have the power to do something, either calling in to animal control about a chain dog or, you know, if these are your neighbors or, you know, going and talking to them, you know, bringing the dog treats or some kind of enrichment, offering to take them for walks and contacting you know, your local officials about enforcing tethering bans so that everywhere has them. When I first started working at PETA, we worked mostly in Hampton Roads. There were tons and tons of backyard dogs. And now there are tethering bans in all of the Hampton Roads cities. And we do not spend nearly as much time in the Hampton Roads area as we did then because the number of neglected and chained isolated dogs went down a lot. Yeah. The, I mean, the anti-tethering laws, I mean, to tether the dog, I guess that's the legal term of chaining. But, yes. you know, they, they've been out there a while, the, these anti-tethering laws, but I think PETA's efforts you know, city by city, at least around the Norfolk Hamp Hampton Roads areas, ha has done a lot to, you know, curtail the practice. And now you're going out to the more rural areas where I guess it's more, more, more dominant now. But there are moves to get anti-tethering laws there. And really, there should be moves all across the country to get anti-tethering laws, right? Yes. Um, you know, we have a... Uh national side teams that deals with uh, these issues across the United States. But, you know, that's a huge area. That's why we need people to know that this is happening out there and that they have the power to do something about it. Really, it opened my eyes. I mean, I, I you know that sometimes people chain dogs and usually it's the, the big dogs, the, the ones that are kind of, um, you know, the stereotype is that they're, oh, the vicious dogs, the, the big muscular. Your guard dogs. The guard dogs, right, yeah. But the guard dogs want to be pampered. They want, they need care, right? They want to be indoors. They, they're not, they're not, there's no distinction between indoor dog and outdoor dog. Absolutely not. Yeah. All dogs are house dogs. All dogs. Are, and, and really, that, that, when you say that to a couple of uh, guardians, in this sort of matter of fact way, it just sort of like, oh my, you know, I can imagine that conversation, you know, how many times he has that with these people with, uh, with their dogs on the chain, but that's the work. That's, that's the, that's the effort that needs to be made that connection, that relationship. And, uh, just conquering. I, uh, I'm glad you're out there doing it because you, you're saving a lot of dogs lives really. Or you're improving their lives by, by helping the guardians see that there's another way. Right. I'm happy to be out there. And I, I hope that, you know, this, this issue ends soon and then I can retire. <laughs> <laughs> With Edith, hopefully. I know she's, she's still got a lot of pep. She does. Anyway. Well, Jess Cochran uh, with the cat with the the cat program, the Community Animal Project with PETA, among the featured uh, field workers in breaking the chain. Thank you, Jess, and and thank you to uh, or say hello to Edith too. I will. Thank you. <laughs> Jess Cochran, one of the field workers of PETA's Community Animal Project, the CAP program, featured in the new documentary, Breaking the Chain, executive produced by Oscar winner Angelica Houston. See the film now on iTunes, Apple TV, Amazon, Google Play, Vudu, and Vimeo On Demand. And go to our show notes for a link to the trailer. And that's for our show this time out. Contact us at PETA.org. 
You can find me on Twitter at Emil Amok, that's E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K, or on amok.com, amok.com, or see my work at the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund, uh, their blog at aldef, A-A-L-D-E-F dot org slash blog. Once again, thank you for listening. Check out all our episodes on Apple Podcasts where you can rate and review the show. It helps get the word out about the issues you care about. And don't forget, you can help the animals and PETA, especially if you have Amazon's Alexa. Just say, Alexa, donate to PETA. Our music is provided by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. And join us again next time for more insight into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty-free world on the PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo.